I'm just a bee. I find any flower and I nest in any tree. And I wait and see. I don't want to do something that might come back to haunt me. Any apple, any tree. I need somewhere to lay my hat, sleep peacefully. But I decay so steadily. I need reassurance that I'm where I'm supposed to be. Oh, cause there are trees and there are flowers. There's a million ways for me to satisfy my needs. And I can't understand it No, I never seem to see Chase the things I want Don't wait for them to come to me Who am I what you need? Do I define success by putting others' minds at ease? So afraid, I'm afraid to be. I take any suggestion and I eat it forcefully. All the options every day. Oh, you say something different, but you say, Sam, it's the only way. But any outcome that I might make someone happy But I'm not sure that someone's me Oh, cause there are trees and there are flowers There's a million ways for me To satisfy my needs When I can understand it No, I never seem to see Chase the things I want Don't wait for them to come to me Oh, don't wait for them to come to me Good afternoon. My name is Andrew Medler, and I am very proud to be president of Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh. And on behalf of our incredibly dedicated board of trustees and our immensely talented staff, it is my honor and pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon to this amazing, incredible, inspiring, and informative event. And also to say happy American Archives Month. How about a round of applause for American Archives Month? <laughs> At Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh, we strive every day to live up to the words which are, et which are etched above the entrance of this building and ensure that our city's libraries and the information housed within their walls are indeed free to the people. We are incredibly and beyond thrilled to welcome David Ferriero, who served as the 10th archivist of the United States before his retirement earlier this year. Nominated by President Barack Obama, David had committed the National Archives and Records Administration to the principles of open government, transparency, participation, and collaboration. 
During his 13-year tenure, the agency embraced social media to embrace a wider and broader audience, just as we're doing today with our guests who are joining us online. Under his direction, the NARA created a crowdsourcing initiative called Citizen Archivists, and to get the public more involved with identifying, describing, and sharing federal records. And in 2013, opened the agency's Innovation Hub, which provides a space where all of us, you and me, can scan, tag, and transcribe items which are held within NARA. And I'm very happy to say that he is no stranger at all to public libraries. In addition to leadership roles at MIT and Duke University, David has also served as the Andrew W. Mellon Director of the New York Public Library. He is joined this afternoon by Ed Galloway, the Associate University Librarian, Archives and Special Collections within the University of Pittsburgh Library System. Ed oversees efforts within the university's digital curation and preservation unit to develop strategies for accessioning, appraising, processing, and providing research access to electronic files as they pertain to the archival collection. As a respected librarian and archivist, he also serves as a main point of contact for donor relations pertaining to gifts of archives, rare books, and manuscripts. Now, while it is indeed home to the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights, NARA holds hundreds of millions of films and tape, more than 14 million still photographs, and billions and billions and billions of pieces of paper. I'm excited to learn more about all the treasures and challenges of dealing with billions and billions and billions and billions and billions of pieces of paper and the challenges in transparency in preserving our nation's heritage. We are gra very grateful to you both. Thank you, David and Ed, for your perspective on the importance of accountability and public access to archival resources and being with us with us all here this afternoon. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Thank you very much, Andrew, for that, for that fantastic introduction. I'm so glad you're here. It is so nice outside, but you decided to come <laughs> here to listen to us talk about archives, of all things. So I am personally very grateful that you would spend some time with us here. And what an honor and delight to be here with David Ferriero, uh, Archivist of the United States. So it's really my pleasure to be here. And thank you, David, for coming here. Honored to be here. This is actually fulfilling a promise I made 100 years ago to Mary Frances Cooper. Um, <laughs> is she here? Mary Frances, are you in the room? Are you here? Yes, I know that. <laughs> we hope she would be here. Yeah. Mary Frances and I worked together at the New York Public Library, and she asked me to come and talk. So we're finally doing that. Well, so David, you're retired now. You threw a bomb on the on the uh, by st starting the a federal investigation to our president and his record keeping practices, and then retired. So uh, I hope you are uh, enjoying retirement as uh, as you've been away now from work for several months now. Well, let me just clarify. <laughs> I had no idea how that was going to play out. All I knew is I had a responsibility to report the fact that in those 15 boxes that were retrieved, there was classified information. At that point, it got turned over to DOJ and then radio silence, I had no idea. Whether they were gonna treat it seriously or what, what, they, what they were gonna do. So I was as surprised as all of you were um, when Mar-a-Lago was raided by the FBI, so. Well, we'll hopefully talk a little bit more about that as we go. So the way the format is, is uh, we're going to do today is I've got some prepared questions and some thoughts to, to give to David. And you, as, you have also provided some questions, both online and in person. We'll do our best to get to those as we can. We have uh, uh, about an hour and a half today together. So let's set the stage, though. Um, maybe not everyone is familiar with the National Archives and Records Administration, as we call it, NARA. That is the acronym that we traditionally refer to, to uh, the government agency that is responsible for the record, record keeping. So can you just tell us a little bit about NARA? How big is it? Andrew gave us some sense of 
of what is there, but I know there's many different libraries. They're scattered throughout the United States. You also oversee the presidential libraries. Could, so could you talk us a little bit about setting the stage for NARA? Sure, so the National Archives is responsible for the government's records, um, and that includes all three branches of, of the government. It is um, a relatively uh, baby agency within the federal government. It was created by legislation signed by Franklin Roosevelt. The National Archives building in Washington opens its doors um, on, in 1934, 1935. It is now um, in 40, over 40 facilities across the country. 15 uh, presidential libraries are part of that empire. All the military oh. records, anyone who ever served in the federal, and anyone who ever served in the federal government are in a facility in St. Louis. It's a staff of about almost 3,000 people. So that's what it, it looks like right now. The mission from the very beginning has been to collect, protect, and encourage the use of the records of the country so that the American people can hold the government accountable for its actions and learn from our past. And it was, even though it wasn't until the 1930s that we opened our doors, there was talk about the need for a National Archives very early on. In fact, I have th three things to read because I want to get the language exactly right. A wonderful letter from Thomas Jefferson that he wrote in um, 1789, where he says that wherever the people are well informed, they can, they can be trusted with their own government, that whenever things go so far wrong as to attract their notice, they may, may be relied on to set them to rights. So that was in 1789. And then in another letter in 1791, he identified um, uh, the issues, some of the issues around um, the, the storage of records. Time and accident are committing daily havoc on originals deposited in our public offices. The late war has done the war work of centuries in this business. The loss cannot be recovered, but let us save what remains, not by vaults and locks which fence them from the public eye and use, in consigning them to the waste of time, but by such multiplication of copies as shall place them beyond the reach of accident. Multiplication of copies. That's my digitization work. I, I point to him as the father of digitization, Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson. And then Franklin Roosevelt, who, who I said signed the legislation for the National Archives, creating the National Archives and dedicating his presidential library, um, which is the um, technically the first of the presidential libraries in 1941, he likened the dedication uh, of the library to an act of faith. To bring together the records of the past and to house them in buildings where they will be preserved for the use of men and women in the future, a nation must believe in three things. It must believe in the past, it must believe in the future, it must, above all, believe in the capacity of its own people so to learn from the past that they can gain in judgment in creating their own future. So from the very beginning, the mission has been open those, open those records. And so let's talk about those records. What exactly does NARA have? What, what we often think of the Declaration of Independence, the Charters of Freedom that we visit there in the rotunda, but According to what I know, there's 13 billion pages of text. There's 16. 10 million maps. 16. 16. Okay, where well, my data may be a little wrong. 25 million photographs and films. So tell us a little bit about the content. So, um, as I said, we cover the three branches of, of the government. And for the executive branch, for instance, just to give you a sense of how it works, 235 agencies and departments each have within their empires, a records management program. They have a records manager who works with my records management appraisal staff to create record schedules that describe the kind of records that are created in that agency. And at the same time, creating retention schedules, how long they need to be kept in the agency and identifying the two to 3% of those records that are created that are 
of historic or legal value that need to be kept forever. And those are the records that get transferred to the National Archives. Those are the records that comprise the, what we have now in terms of 16 billion pieces of paper and um, um, growing amounts of, of electronic records, of course. So, so the, it's, it's, not a, it's not a government specific process. Records management exists in the university, it exists in um, schools and corporations. Um, it's a, a, a discipline of um, capturing the important records that are created every day in the entity and making sure that they're available, in my case, in perpetuity for use by the American public. Right. And so we're probably more, most familiar with the building that sits in DC, in the District of Columbia, where uh, the Charters of Freedom are. But there's also a facility in College Park, uh, which is called Archives 2, I think at least how we know that, where, where a lot of researchers also go. And there is content stored there. But am I right that there's also 14 regional NARA exactly buildings? right does that sound right and if you want to know why they are cited where they are just take a look at the funding stream um, in terms of earmarks in the budget whoever squawked the loudest over time uh, and as a member of Congress was able to get a facility in their in their district so we were spread out all over the country. It has, it, there's no relationship to where the records were created. It's just who paid for the who paid for the building. Quite interesting. So who who uses NARA? Who uses the resources? What does the typical researcher, if there is a typical researcher, look like? It's a wide variety of users. Um, I, I I would start with uh, I think our largest user group are genealogists and. Um, um, the, the publication of Roots was the, launched a, an incredible um, series of events around learning how I got to where I am in the National Archives because of the, the census records, the ship's passenger list records, all of the, the rich information about our, our heritage became a you know, focal, focal point for doing that kind of research. So certainly genealogists, recreational genealogists, professional genealogists are high on our list. The, and I would say of equal numbers are our veterans. Uh, in order to get um, medical ben education, uh, home loan benefits from, um, for, based on your service, you need to be able to prove your service and a lot of what happens at our facility in St. Louis is the delivery of DD 214s, the separation document, to prove as the proof of um, service. So um, pre-pandemic that was about 5,000 requests a day for that kind of information. Now I understand you yourself have used the archives to do some genealogy research, That's is right. that right? I Tell have. us about that. I have. So um, I was, I'm of Irish and Italian descent, and I was always much more interested, in, to the chagrin of my mother, always much more interested in the Italian side of the family. Um, they seemed more mysterious than the Irish. Um, my father was one of 13 kids. He was the first one born in the States. He, um, his parents were from the same little town in Italy, um, came to the States and um, settled in Massachusetts. So forever I've been interested in, no one in the family seemed interested. I, my uncles and aunts couldn't have cared less about, didn't have any family history to share with me about Italy and where they were and, and all that. So I started using the records um, um, of the National Archives to see what I could find out about my relatives and discovered the town, um, using the name of the town, searching um, ship's passenger lists, I was able to find my grandmother's arrival in the country and my grandfather's. My grandfather was 15 years old when he came into the country and if you ever looked at a passenger list, 
um, record. It's got great information because it tells you, you know, how much money you have in your pocket and who's meeting you. And it's that who's meeting you piece that, that was really very interesting to me. Because we had always been told that my grandfather was the first one into the country. And when I got a hold of my grandfather's arrival um, record, he was actually being met by his father. So my great-grandfather was the first one in the country. So that turned out to be, you know, the beginning of my own, you know, interest in, in discovering my roots through the records of the National Archives. Yeah. Now, did that occur while you were archivist for the United States or before? No, it, be it happened before. Before? Before, before yeah. So, uh, interesting. Okay. So, we've talked about NARA, we've talked about government records and documents. Often people get confused with the Library of Congress and the National Archives. Can you just distinguish the two? Sure. Um, as I said, we didn't start until 1930s. That's when Robert Connor, who was the first archivist of the United States, appointed by Franklin Roosevelt, wandered around town to discover where the records were as he was planning this building and this agency. Everything before that had been collected in the agencies for federal records, and a lot of the presidential stuff uh, was at the Library of Congress. It was either donated or bought by the Library of Congress. So Library of Congress got started in the late 1800s, so they had an earlier start than we did. So much of the earlier government records are in the in the Library of Congress. Um, it's a it's it's a great story uh, indication of, of the lack of collaboration in the federal government that I love sharing with my my colleague Carla Hayden, who is the uh, Librarian of Congress now. Um, when the when the National Archives was opened in 1935. The librarian of the charters, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the Declaration of Independence were stored at the Library of Congress, and the the archives building was designed with a rotunda and a, a tabernacle for the Declaration of Independence that was going to be on the wall as you come into the rotunda. The librarian of Congress refused to release the <laughs> the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> And that went on until uh, basically he said over my dead body, and that's when it and that's when it came. That would have <laughs> Harry Truman said, a "New Librarian of Congress, Harry, new president." Harry Truman said, "Get that declaration." <laughs> so the way Carla tells the story, um, we sent we sent tanks up to the <laughs> Library of Congress. And there were tanks. They had a, a huge procession, a military procession, to bring um, the Declaration of Independence down Pennsylvania Avenue into the, in, onto Constitution Avenue, up the steps, into the rotunda, <laughs> where it sits now. <laughs> now we've all seen National Treasure, so I have to ask: Does Declaration of Independence really disappear into this, you know, chamber down below? So, one of the first things that I had to do when I became archivist was to sign a non-disclosure statement about the security of the Declaration of Independence. So I can't tell you that. So I can't tell you that. But you know I had to ask, right? It is still, it is still the most asked question in the rotunda. People still say, can I see the back of the Declaration? Yeah, that's right. There's a map, right? And is there anything so, on the back? That's some, uh, yeah. yeah, okay, yeah. that's great. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Andrew talked a little bit about open government, and let's talk about the importance of, of the records. And I would like to, to say that you, in your retirement statement, uh, said that it's given you the opportunity to bring openness, access, and inclusion to NARA. And then President Obama, who nominated you in his sentiments to your retirement, said over the past 12 years, David Ferriero has guided NARA into the 21st century and our democracy is stronger as a result. What in the world does democracy and the papers that are stored at NARA, how are they related? 
Why should, why should we care? Why should the public care? Why, that's a strong statement for the president to say that. But it goes back to that original message from Thomas Jefferson and from FDR about the uh, importance of making those, our, de our democracy depends upon the ability of our citizens to be able to use those records to prove whatever they're trying to prove. Um, and, and one hopes that as a government we learn from how the same kinds of issues were, were handled in the past. The Open Government Initiative was, was actually what convinced me to, to, um, to go to Washington. I was, I was you know, the director of the New York Public Libraries um, from now looks like a pretty cushy job. <laughs> and um, on a Friday afternoon, I got a call out of the blue from this 12-year-old working on appointments for the White House. He was, a, he was an undergraduate at, at Georgetown, um, George Washington, and said, we're looking at you for Archivist of the United States. And I you know, said, I'm really flattered, but um, I think you're looking at the wrong person. It's usually someone who's given a lot of money to a campaign. Um, why, uh, not, not someone who knew the business for, forever, former governor of Kansas was the archivist. Um, so he asked me to think it over the weekend and he'd call back on Monday and he did and we had the same conversation on Monday. And 10 minutes later an adult called and asked if, if he could come to Washington and talk to me, which he did. And talked about the president's open government initiative, which is, um, which, which I think the best description of it um, was a statement that he made to his senior staff on his first day in office when he said that the government doesn't have all the answers and we need to figure out ways to uh, engage the American public in solving our problems. And I tried to think about how can we, as the National Archives, fulfill that vision by, helping, by having members of the American public help us do our work. And that's what created, that was the genesis of the Citizen Archivist Program. 16 billion um, pieces of paper, you know, in the records, and I would say right now about 85% of those are in cursive. And guess what? <laughs> cursive isn't being taught. We've got a couple of generations of kids who can't read our records. Um, so the first piece of the Citizen Archivist Program was a transcription project where we have loaded thousands of records in cursive and volunteers from all over the world actually now are um, transcribing those records for us. We've got 43 million photographs um, not described very carefully. Um, so we've loaded thousands of uh, photographs for people to help us tag them about places, if they recognize the place, the people, add content to what we can, uh, how we can describe the records. So those are a couple of aspects of engaging the public and helping us do our work. It sure is. Well, the Citizen Archivist has really gotten a lot of attention. In fact, uh, I was just at our, our regional archival conference in College Park for the last few days, and there was a presentation by one of your staff members on the success of the Citizen Archivist Project. So you might not be aware of this, but to date there are, they reported at least, 208 million digital objects that have been addressed through this, through this process, which is amazing. And you can do that at scale when you're yeah. National Archives and have that. And here's something else interesting, because we'll talk a little bit about COVID in, in a minute or two, but uh, according to uh, to your colleague here, in the in fiscal year 2019, so just a few years ago, 493,000 transcriptions mm -hmm. took place in that year. Fast forward to a few years later in, in FY22, which we're in right now still, there are over, do you know this? Two million transcriptions as a result of, of, of the work that you set in place there over a decade ago. And, and we had no idea that COVID was coming down the pike at us. And I am so pleased that we did carve out this um, from a very tight budget to be able to do this because during the COVID uh, experience, we were able to provide a fairly high level of reference service based on 
the work that had been going on uh, on this on this initiative. So it really played it played itself out. So other parts of open government that I believe you had a hand in social media efforts to really ramp up that as well, mm -hmm. right? Could you talk a little bit about I'm sure about that? Wow. <laughs> what keeps me up at night? Oh, okay. So when I was um, the interview process, I, I think it's easier to um, appoint a pope than it is the archivist of the United States. <laughs> because it's an elaborate uh, interview process with members of the committee, the, the Senate um, nomination committee, and so individual meetings with those, those people. And I was on a train to Washington from um, New York, t uh, headed to one of those meetings when I was reading an article in the New York Times about the White House letting an RFP request for, for a proposal for help in managing their social media accounts. And I'm like, what? where the hell is the National Archives if the White House is looking for help outside the government to, to do the job of the archives? And that was my introduction to the sad state of um, social media attention in the National Archives. So when I got there, um, I um, started asking questions and discovered that there was a small group of folks who were curious about um, social media and interested in um, talking, they were talking about things, they were dreaming basically about things that, that they would do with social media. And I walked into one of their meetings once uh, early on and um, it, was, it was interesting because they thought they were busted, you know. They were, uh, <laughs> the big guys here and and we sat and talked and it was a it was a great exciting it was an exciting moment for me because it's, it's to get an opportunity to see the enthusiasm of the staff for for this future direction and um, so I at that meeting I authorized the acquisition of 25 um, iPads and 25 iPhones and then the next morning, I got the first call from the CIO, the then CIO, who said, I understand you want iPads and iPhones. And I said, yeah, isn't it exciting? We're going to be experimenting with, um, you know, we don't support that technology. <laughs> so that was my introduction to the bureaucracy of the, um, the um, information technology infrastructure. And then the next call was from the acquisitions department. I had the same conversation. Isn't it exciting we're going to be? And he said, well, that'll take 13 months, you know, to get those in house. And I said, you know, that doesn't work for me. 13 months is like two generations of technology. <laughs> so we finagled a way to get the iPhones and iPads. And that was the beginning of this launch. And my attitude, it wasn't, I wasn't fooling around here. My attitude was, if the federal government is going to be using social media to do their business and there are records implications of that use, then we need to be providing the guidance. And if we're not using the stuff, how are we going to provide the guidance? So we're now on 16 platforms <laughs> and providing guidance to the agencies about the records implications of those, hmm. those uh, social media platforms. And there are huge records implications, there, especially with the the some of the newer ones which allow you to not retain <laughs> the content that immediately disappears or disappears after a certain period of time. So all kinds of twists that the social media has um, brought to the equation. So let's, uh, let's turn our attention to presidential records. Mm -hmm. I know we're all very interested about, about that, but before we dive too deep, uh, NARA administers the presidential records really just from the last 13 presidents, if I'm correct on that. Is that right? I mean, the, the, not every president has received a building and the National Archives does not oversee all of their papers. That's a more recent uh, uh, trend, is that correct? Well, actually, um, FDR was first and that was a gift. Um, it, was, it was a gift to the country the building and the, um, the, the, the records, because at that point those records were mm -hmm. considered um, the president's. 
And Harry Truman, I mean Harry, Herbert Hoover loved that idea, so he decided he wanted a presidential library, and he, he followed suit. And, and after that, everyone followed suit. That was, you know, how, how it played out. Until, until Richard Nixon, who decided he was going to take all of his stuff and not, not share it. And that's when things got messy, and that was when the Presidential Records Act was first created. So, so those are the, the pre-PRA and post-PRA um, records uh, facilities. And the post-PRA, post the, the PRA facilities are partially funded by the federal government. They, a private foundation is established, raises the money to build the building, um, builds it to um, government specifications in terms of security and temperature and humidity and those kinds of things, and then turns it over to the federal government when it's dedicated. That's the pattern that has been. I, when I arrived in Washington in the, in the job, just before I arrived, Congress had requested an analysis of the future of presidential libraries. The staff had um, painted a picture, or, um, wrote a report, a white paper, and, and spelled out five different models. One of those, those models being um, don't build a library, take that money and digitize everything instead because of the, where we were going with electronic records. And that is indeed what we did with the Obama library. The Obama Presidential Library will be, is now, all digital. And it turns out that 90% of the records created during the Obama administration were born digital. No paper equivalent. And those who say, well, why don't you just print out paper? I say, <laughs> that's not the wave of the future. So we have created the Obama Presidential Library, which is digital. The Trump Presidential Library is digital. And unless something happens um, to change that, that, that is the future. That is the future. That okay. is the future. So in a, dare, dare I say, normal world, uh, what is the transfer of presidential records from one administration <laughs> to the next? What is that supposed to look like? It's an in interesting process. Yeah. Um, so we used to say we prefer a two-term presidency, which gives us mm -hmm. more time to, to plan. Time, yeah. But in, in any case, um, midway during the first term of a presidency, we start the conversations with White House legal staff about the what if situation, to be prepared for uh, a one term administration. We need to be able to make sure that the, all the pieces are in place so that there's an orderly transfer of those records at the appropriate time. And at the appropriate time is usually on inauguration day itself is when the bulk of, of records get transferred, paper records anyway, get transferred to the National Archives. Until that, un, until that time, the records are stored there at the, at the White House. So um, that's the way it normally works. And we have been experimenting, we, uh, it was very successful with, in the Obama years, um, to experiment with pre-accessioning, so to identify categories of records that they didn't actually need on site that we could move uh, before, before the inauguration day. And then there's the whole electronic record uh, scenario, which is um, separate from the paper transfer, but that's also um, something that, that we've been, have success in sequencing pre-transfer of digital photographs, for instance, billions of uh, starting with Obama, actually, Obama, Trump, um, digital photographs are, are huge. So those get pre-accession moved early. And then um, the formal transfer of the electronic records is on Inauguration Day. Well, on that day. So, yeah. so <laughs> what can you tell us about the record-keeping practices of, of President Trump? I, we've heard stories of of people being shredded or thrown in the sure. toilet, uh, yeah. things like that. Can you can you tell us? Is that true? Is that, have yeah, you seen it's that? true. Yes, it's true. Um, and I think you 
you see as much as I see in the press, um, have seen for the, that entire administration about examples of um, the haphazard way that records were treated. The tearing up of records, um, there's the, the, um, the situation with the torn records in, in toilets, um, clogging, clogging toilets. I don't know if you remember, there was a period when the president was, in his speeches, was talking about toilets and flushing. You remember that? Mm -hmm. And it turns out that that was, he, the example he was using was it, um, what? Uh, was happening when when he was flushing records. So there there have been forever ex for, for throughout the term um, examples of uh, situations where we were concerned about treatment of records, and in each one of those cases, our legal counsel communicated with their legal counsel to uh, remind them about what the law is and what. To, first of all, to verify um, what's going on, and then to um, let them know what what needs to be done to to correct the situation. So there have been a series of throughout that term of uh, situations where we had concerns. Now I can say, having been through um, several transfers, several cha changes of administration, and based on the staff experience. The, the startup of a new administration is always fraught with examples of people who don't quite understand what they need to do. So, you know, training and retraining is something that, that, that we're used to. But the consistent, you know, ig ignoring of uh, policy and practice um, was, was a bigger problem, I think um, it's safe to say. Um, there was another piece of this, oh, you may not know this, but there are 4,000 political appointees every year. 4,000 coming in, 4,000 going out at the end of an administration. So all of those, that includes executive branch and, and White House uh, covered by um, Presidential Records Act and Federal Records Act. But each of those people, the 4,000 coming in, need to be trained on what the rules are. And, and when they're leaving at the end of the administration, they need to. Um, the, they need the same kind of training about what they're leaving behind, how how to leave leave that behind. That's a huge, um, huge part of of um, what we do. Right. Well, I know there's only so much you can say about about what is going on there presently, since there's a federal investigation now. But I'm curious to know if you can tell us about the 15 boxes. Like, how, how did anyone even know there were these were missing? that they were somewhere so, else where they should not have been. So White House records are um, um, the, I told you that each federal agency has a records management unit within their um, agency. At the White House, it's called the White House Office of Records Management, the WORM. And um, it reports directly to, you know, through the staff secretary to the president. Uh, it's not part, in, in the, these units are not part of the National Archives. They follow regulations promulgated by the National Archives, but they're not part, of, I have no authority over, over the White House Office of Records Management. But we have a close working relationship and the, the head of that unit is a good friend and has, has become a good friend. And I called him in December it was around the holidays because I was calling to wish him a happy holiday. Um, and December after the election, and he told me that there were 24 boxes of records in the residence, and that um, he was it was prom they were promised to be delivered um, to him for transfer. So that was in December, in January. When the transfer took place, those 24 boxes weren't there. Um, and that started a series of uh, conversations at various levels within the National Archives and the White House, between the National Archives and the White House, um, and finally resulted in the delivery of 15 boxes. 
and they were empty, were they not? Or there was no, they were um, they missing were, missing documents and file folders with nothing in them. And no, that was the, that's the stuff that came from Mar the Mar-a-Lago. Um, it was a mixture of uh, stuff, but the disturbing part was that there were a hundred classified records in in the boxes. Um, that was that was the. That's what got your attention. That got, <laughs> yeah, that got my attention, and that was um, so. That was what got referred. To, that was the trigger for referring that to the Department of Justice. That's mm -hmm. where they have the legal chops to deal with that. Right. And at that point, you know, it's basically radio silence. You know, you turn it over and you don't know. You don't know what's happening. Yeah. yeah. So you mentioned uh, classified records, and mm -hmm. I think that. Uh, many people will not are not aware that in fact NARA has a center for de declassification, mm -hmm. and and you you're, you and your staff actually play that role yeah. in doing that. Can you tell us a little bit about what that's like, um, how they do their work? Well, first of all, let's talk about classified information because it's a real issue um, within the federal government. There are. Um, when I started in uh, 2009, there were about 9,600 classifiers, original classifiers in the executive branch. And that is now down to about 2,400, I believe. Um, and the, the reason that, that it's a problem is that there are no standards for classification. Um, so that what one classifier thinks is a, um, top secret, another may not think so at all. Um, so there are no standards. Um, and, th and this is a concern that's been bubbling up for many years. There's a public, declassifi public declassification information board, which is a, um, not part of the federal agency, but sits outside of the National Archives and advises the president on, and Congress on issues around classification, declassification, and the problem with overclassification and the lack of standards for classification have been on the agenda for many years. You can go to, you can Google PIDIB, P Public Declassification Information Board, and see the, the whole set of recommendations. But because of that, um, that means that in order to declassify something. Um, you need to go through the process for declassification. Um, and it's fairly common, especially in intelligence classified material, to have multiple agencies who have equities in that classification product. So it's not just the Air Force who has classified it, but FBI, CIA may have a, a, a piece of it also. And to complicate it even more, they may have classified it at a different level. <laughs> so it'll have multiple classifications and possibly multiple levels of classification. So it's very complicated and it's not, it's not easy to declassify. I can't imagine that that's gotta be an enormous challenge. And, Huge. And I, let's, let's just talk about that some more, some other, other challenges that NARA faces. Uh, you mentioned electronic records earlier. I mean, uh, I have a stat here that the, uh, under, under um, Ob Ob Obama, I believe, let me just look here. The, there were just, was it 20, yeah, here we go, under, no, Clinton, Pre President Clinton had 20 million emails in his, in his presidential records, and that ballooned to 240 million emails in the Bush. In Bush 43. So, how, yeah. what, Bush 43. Yeah, yeah. so tell us, start, start there, because I, I know I'm curious to know uh, how in the world does NARA manage email at that scale and, and just in general electronic records and some of the other challenges that are facing the agency? So we've, um, we've been working on a revised electronic records archive facility, which is um, designed to ingest these records. And um, and be able to migrate them into new technologies as the technologies change. One of the one of the real issues is the obsolescence of, mm -hmm. of certain forms of uh, electronic records. And in fact, we um, some work that was done um, by our folks a couple of years ago 
identifying the number of file formats that we that exist in in our records. It's over 500, almost 600 different, different kinds, and each one of those requires a different kind of um, longevity treatment or transfer um, algorithm in order to ensure that the content gets migrated over time into new technologies. So it's a it is a huge issue, and it's not it's not just you know our issue. It's anyone who's in the electronic record business ha is in for long periods of time has the same kind of need for better tools and better better philosophy around maintaining the records. So one of the ways we've approached that for the executive branch anyway is um, identifying the top level of an agency's records that need to be maintained. Does, does the, asking the question, does everyone in that agency's records need to be maintained or is there a level of um, uh, management, supervision, long-term legal and historical value that needs to be kept and that's the approach that many agencies have taken in rewriting their record schedules. And what, how, did, how did COVID affect all of this too? Was that, what, what kind of a challenge did that end up this was, uh, forcing um, and we yeah. all have experienced that? So 40, as I said, for, 42 facilities, each one in a different state, uh, most of them in different states, um, so that the COVID situation was different for each of these facilities. So it was weekly monitoring of the COVID situation in for each of the facilities to determine whether, based on the, the guidance that was provided by the White House, whether they we could have people back in the buildings. So for many months, all the buildings were shut down and then we slowly started coming back. And I think the biggest issue that we had was that St. Louis, the military records, ensuring that veterans were able to get the at least health care and burial benefits um, and, and, and finally education benefits also. Um, but some of the other things um, were delayed. So it was, uh, um, it was a, a nightmare in terms of managing and for the staff. Um, we were we benefited from the first um, funding opportunity. We got laptops for everyone in the agency to work from home. So that enabled us to, as I said, we were able to do a fair amount of of our reference work, but it also allowed people to do the, the transcription kind of work, mm -hmm. and um, that really that really paid off. So as you look towards the future, what, what other challenges does, does NARA face? We, um, the funding is, is always the biggest problem. We are, um, and I would say that this is, this is an issue for, it's not just NARA, but the executive branch in general. I think that information technology is key to successful operation of our government, and information technology has never been funded at the appropriate level. Um, for the, for agencies to do the work, and it's not just the National Archives, but it's every agency um, has the need for robust, regularly updated um, information technology, and it just that message just hasn't um, gotten through. Mm -hmm. So, right now, there's a new archivist in waiting, and we, yes. we hope, right? yes. Colleen Shogun. A uh, woman, a woman. Can you believe yeah. it? So, so yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> How is her experience different than yours? Or tell us what your experience was like going through that process, and where does it stand with her right now? So, um, she is a political scientist by training. She worked in the Congressional Research Service at the Library of Congress. She is currently the um, associate director of the White House Historical Society Association, White House, White House Historical Association, and she is the um, author of eight murder mysteries. 
um, set in different places in Washington, D.C., <laughs> which are pretty good. Uh, she has been through the vetting process. Um, she has um, been um, the in the committee. She so, so she's had her first hearing, and the committee voted after the hearing, and the um, it was a tie vote, um, which means that she wasn't confirmed. She needs now there need to be three more. Three more votes in this process. Um, so, and there, you know, things are basically closed down on the Hill for um, until after the mid midterms. So, that's where it stands now. Mm -hmm. And your experience, what was that like? Far different. Right? Far different. Far yeah, different. it was. Um, boy, um, I went through the um, before I got to the hearing. Just before I got to the hearing. I met with all of the, um, the members of the committee and recovered from the, the one who asked me, the unnamed congressman who asked me, so why do you want to be the architect of the United Arch States? <laughs> um, and then all of a sudden, um, a hold was placed on my um, nomination. And that's the way the process works. If someone has a concern, they can put a hold on it, and they don't have to. to, to collect, they don't have to be public about it. But uh, a hold is a hold. Mm -hmm. So the White House was concerned and didn't know what it was all about. And it turned out it was Lamar Alexander, who from Tennessee, who um, put a hold on it. And so they sent me to meet with Lamar and talk about. Um, and he was very embarrassed, um, but he had to do this. And a constituent of his reported that the director of the Nixon Library was saying some pretty anti-Nixon things. And he thought I should know about that. And um, he told me about it. And I told, me I, would, I told him I would look into it. And then we had a great conversation about his time at University of Tennessee as president. And his wife, Honey, who is on the board of the National Archives Foundation. And, um, it, it all moved very smoothly, and then it was um, a unanimous confirmation. And that was it. Yeah, it doesn't ha that doesn't happen these days <laughs> anymore. Right. Yeah. So prior to that, you served at Duke University, at MIT, at uh, and in New York Public Library. But you're not an archivist, is that right? You've not. Uh, can you believe it? No. So so tell us about curious. what. Yeah. What's background? And Harriet, I'm still looking for Harriet. When, um, when my nomination was announced, Harriet on some history list serve said, he's only a librarian. <laughs> <laughs> so what, 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 what background, what experiences prepared you for this? And uh, what would you? Lord, I, I was, I am by training a librarian and I'm a library administrator and I was responsible for the archives at MIT the archives at Duke, and the archives at the New York Public Library. So, I, you know, it's not as if I don't know archives. And then if you look at it, you know, it, it's, it's really an artificial separation of, of you know, um, attitudes about librarians versus archivists. It's the same work. It's collecting, protecting, and encouraging the use of, and then fill in the blank. Of course, the collections are different. Um, they require different kinds of treatment and organization, and, but it's, the basic business is the same. That's what, so that's, that was how I got, but, but I still had you know, an issue uh, in terms of people feeling, under, not understanding what, how could a librarian understand this. Yeah. So what are some of your, as you look back on your, on your tenure there, what are you most proud of? What's some of your most, uh, the greatest memories that you'll that you'll have with you. I think the um, citizen archivist stuff is is really really powerful. It's um, been emulated. The transcription piece of it, anyway, has been emulated by a lot of of institutions, and I think um, demonstrating to the American public the value of um, participation in their government that way uh, has been rewarding. All of the work that, that we've been doing in, in terms of um, 
refining and revising um, the uh, requirements for using material, making it easier for people to get what they need. I put a stake in the ground in our first digital, in our first strategic plan that my goal was to digitize everything in the in the in the records. Mm -hmm. That the the only way that we were going to be really successful is to get as much content um, digitized as possible, and I, I I stand I still stand by that because that is the future. Um, the new model, I think the new presidential library model is new and exciting, and I um, I think that will will prove itself to be beneficial, um, as, as, especially since it will encourage the current um, presidential libraries to go back and digitize um, so that we have, uh, at some point in our future, we have a complete digital presidential collection. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I think, um, you know, on the, on the lighter side, um, we started doing sleepovers in the rotunda. <laughs> Have you done that yourself? I did. Um, several of them, yeah. We do 8 to 12 year olds um, huh. come and spend a weekend, a Saturday night, Sunday morning with us, series of activities throughout the, um, the rotunda in the building, and they sleep on the floor of the rotunda. Wow in the presence of the charters. And so they don't disappear underground. I can't talk about that. <laughs> and then Sunday morning, I flip pancakes for a pancake breakfast. Yeah, it's, it's really great. And it's, it's really nice. These, these kids are self-selecting nerds, history nerds, and they are just tingling. You know, it's really exciting. It's really nice. Well, maybe that's what, what we need uh, Colleen to do, is take, the, take all the senators that were voted we yes talked no. about Put them in the rotunda, we do a sleepover, <laughs> and resolve this, right? Yeah. So I want to I wanna turn to some of our questions from, from our audience. These are ones that, that came online to us. And you've, you've, you've uh, addressed some of these. Some other ones, though, are kind of fun here. What, what is the best discovery in the archives? Like, we, we know some of the big documents. We've talked about some of those important ones. But are there other things that surprised you? A document that we would not normally know about? That yeah, I, I think high on that list is um, from the presidential records. Um, when I became the archivist and met with the directors of the presidential libraries for the first time, this was at the Carter Library, they went around the room and introduced themselves, and the director of the Kennedy handed me a copy of a letter that a kid wrote to the president asking for information about the proposed Peace Corps. And it's a letter for me. <laughs> <laughs> and I had forgotten all about that letter. I remember being interested in the Peace Corps, but I'd forgotten all about that letter. But you sent so, it in. But the stunning thing was watching the faces of the other directors because they were like, oh my God, how am I going to top this? <laughs> <laughs> so two weeks later, the Eisenhower called to say they'd found two letters from the President Eisenhower. And when I was at the LBJ, they handed me the cop a copy of a letter that I wrote to LBJ congratulating him for signing the Civil Rights Act. Hmm. That's awesome. So those wow. are, you know, I wasn't expecting to see those. No, not at all. Wow. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So some of these questions appear to come from uh, students mm. here at, yeah. at Pitt, right? We've got a, a program, a graduate program training graduate students to become yep. archivists, and we, we certainly enjoy uh, having them with us in our, in our uh, in archives and special collections. Uh, so what advice would you give to students who are in, in, in learning to be in the profession right now or early career? What words of wisdom or advice would you give them as they embark on their career? I would advise you to get involved, volunteer, look for opportunities to learn and contribute wherever you, you, wherever you can. Um, one, of the, one of the issues around the profession, and this is gross generalization, so don't be offended if you fall into this category, but the, but the um, profession attracts a lot of introverts. I'm an introvert myself. Um, so don't let that get in your way about volunteering for helping 
the archive, if it's the archives you're interested in and there's a specific kind of archives you're interested in, get to know the people who work there and volunteer your services. That's uh, the best way. Show some interest. Schedule a meeting with the archivist and talk about what the career, what a career in that kind of archives is. Um, the, there are so many jobs in archives that don't, don't peg yourself as a certain kind of archivist until you get some experience in wandering around and, and talking with folks. And, and archivists love to talk about what they, what they do, so, <laughs> right? That's true. So what do you think of the current trends or, or predictions for the profession? Are you, you happy from where you sit that things are on the right traje trajectory? I think um, as, as difficult as this last couple of years has been, I think that um, the, the light that has been shining on archives and the importance of archives is uh, positive. I think that a recognition of the role that archivists play in our society, I think, is um, is a valuable takeaway from from all of this um, drama that's going on right now. Thank you. I like this one. Who has unfettered access to the National Archives? Unfettered. <laughs> um, well, there was Sandy Berger who left with <laughs> who left with some records yeah. in his sock. It is, it is, yeah, that's right. Uh, unfettered, I, I don't think, I, you, need to, you need to describe what unfettered means. So as, as you know, there's a lot of classified information in the National Archives, there, so you don't have unfettered access to that. Um, you don't have, I, I think that what the question is getting at is you don't, there aren't a lot of restrictions about using the National Archives. If you're 16 years old, I believe, it is. Um, you can register for a card for, to use the National Archives and you get to use the records. Yeah. And that's so in some respects we do. We, we as the public have some degree, but yes. unfettered access. You do. I mean, they are there for exactly. us to, exactly. to use. And you have, you know, as you, as you heard, we've got millions of things online that's um, purely unfettered, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So a similar question is, with so much information or misinformation out there, how can the arc, how can, how can, how has the role of the archivist changed with dealing with misinformation as well as information? So we are um, responsible for managing the records created by the U.S. government. So if the U.S. government is creating misinformation, we've got a problem here. Yeah. Um, and I don't think it's the role of the National Archives to be, it, this, is, this is not just the National Archives issue, this is an issue for the government in general about um, how that misinformation may creep into the creation or, or manipulation of government records. And you've seen some of that in the press about how um, certain administrations have restricted or, or actually changed um, information that has been created. Hmm. I'm just reading, reading some of these too. This is another interesting one. Are there, are there laws and regulations in place to prevent what is occurring now with 45 by that President Trump? And are there appropriate penalties? Um, there are laws uh, about destruction, mutilation, and the penalties are fines and up to three years in prison for that kind of, uh, of behavior, so there are laws. There aren't, however, in the, the, I mentioned there are two sets of laws, Federal Records Act and Presidential Records Act. Federal Records Act is anything that 
covers the 285 agencies within the executive branch. Federal, the Presidential Records Act is everything that's created in the White House. And they give, um, they're, they're very different in terms of the authority that they give to the archivist. So I have much more control over what goes on in the executive branch than I do with uh, presidential records. I have to approve any destruction of records from the White House, and I need to report any unauthorized destruction that I become aware of. But I don't have investigative um, authority uh, in, the White, in the White House Office of Records Management. So related to that, is the Presidential Records Act today, does it need to be changed? Yes. Does it need to be improved yes. to address these yes. things? Okay. Yes. Tell us about that, your thoughts. Well, I have a, you know, this is, my, my staff doesn't like to hear about this, um, but my, my attitude is that the independence of the National Archives as an agency needs to be strengthened should serve as a model for managing records management across the government. So the records management operations in each of those executive branches and in the White House should report to the National Archives. Mm -hmm. That's the only way that that true independence is going to, is going to be played out. This, and the model is how the federal government has treated the inspector general community so in the inspector generals for each of the agencies are responsible for um, monitoring waste, fraud, and abuse in each of the agencies, and they are an independent entity, um, not subject to the control of the agency head, and I think that's what really needs to happen. Wow, okay. So, thank you for coming. Uh, I want to definitely address any questions that you might have, and. Jess, are, are there questions that we've collected that you would like to let me know? <laughs> this is from Zoom. 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 Okay. Do we have some in the house too? Okay, all right, Zoom. What is the status of negotiation between the Trump administration and the National Archives for the establishment of a Trump library. There have been, there are, there's nothing to report. <laughs> there's, not, there's nothing Excellent. to report. Uh, as I said, the, um, we have established the Trump Presidential Library online. But if you're asking about the, in, because the records, you know, we're responsible for the records, and which is one of the reasons we're trying to get the records back. Um, but what they will be building will be a Trump museum, not a Trump library. Now, and that's exactly what's happening in Chicago. Yeah, I was going to say, isn't Obama doing the same yes, thing? Yes, exactly. Right, because the records will be, as you said, digital, the, electronic. And they belong to the National Archives. But there'll be a museum, if it's fair to say, on his presidency. We're talking, I'm talking about President Obama. Yes. In Chicago. It's, that is it's part of, of, of the civic center mm -hmm. that they're creating. So then privately funded? Yes. And not, not, not by the government. Right? Exactly. Okay. Yep. And we believe something similar with President Trump, as far as we know. Unless he becomes the 47th president, right? I would, okay. I would expect so. Yeah. All right. Let me make sure I can understand. So, question from the audience here. Uh, concerns, tell us about your concerns about the safety for the integrity of the digitization of records, mm. like to do corruption or hacking. Yeah, it's a, it's a really, it's a scary uh, situation uh, in terms of uh, crypto security and the ability to, to, to delete, but worse, to alter uh, electronic records. It's... Um, scary and it's something that um, all of us who deal with electronic records worry about and try and ensure monitoring, monitoring breaches to our systems 
ensuring that we have backup, um, all kinds of things to um, protect the integrity of our content, especially now that we're storing in the cloud and the concerns about um, hacking into um, cloud content. Um, the federal government has put a lot of money into the cloud uh, and security in the, in the cloud, so, um, but there again, it's one of those things that has always kept me up. Yeah. Yeah, this is a, a, this is a really good question, and it's about, up until now, it's probably fair to say that NARA has been pretty neutral, right? It's been a, generally seen as a positive good, but now it's gotten politicized. And now what, uh, with um, what, what uh, Ms. Shogun is going through, right? Are, what, what are your concerns about the current politicization of NARA for the safety or, le or legitimacy from Trump's contempt? I can't quite re read this word, but um, contempt? Contempt, is that what the word is of it? So the um, the rule of law is um, what we swear an oath to uh, when we join the federal government, and keeping our eye on that responsibility is w what keeps us on the job. And I have confidence in the folks who are coming in behind me, who are there now, to be able to do that. And um, the um, democracy will survive. Um, it's, I'm the first one to admit that this is you know, a terrible, terrible time to have the um, staff and the very mission of my agency under attack. But there's, you know, there's, <laughs> This is the rule of law. Those records belong to the, you. Those records belong to the, the American public. That's right, thank you. Another question is, com can you comment on the censorship of the photograph of the Women's March? Uh, Do you think this has affected the public percep perception of NARA? I don't know, you tell me. <laughs> that was a mistake. And I was the first one to admit that was a mistake. We should not have done that. I, I, although I can say it will never happen again, I don't. I hope it never happens again. But so there was. Um, you don't know. Okay. So we opened an exhibit um, on the um, passage of the Nineteenth Amendment, and uh, one of the exhibit items, not in the exhibit, but outside the room, <laughs> was um, a clever lenticular um, photo, two photographs. The first photograph was the Women's March on Washington in 1919 for the vote, black and white photo. And as you walk by it, it turns into the Women's March on Washington um, after the Trump inauguration or after the Trump um, um, when he won the election, with the pink hats and, and everything. And the, um, a decision was made because of the language of one of the signs to blur it. This is a, um, a service that um, Getty, <laughs> Getty Photos provides, who, who knew? Um, and it was done. Six months later, uh, after the exhibit had opened, a reporter from the Washington Post discovered it um, and then um, reported on it, and all hell broke loose. And I apologized for it. We corrected it and moved on. This is about tweets. We know mm. that President Trump lived by, by, by Twitter. So should his, should President Trump's tweets 
be considered part of the president of his presidential records. They are. Yeah, that's what I thought. They are already. Yeah. And Even the deleted those? ones. I thought the Even library. the deleted ones. Yeah. Yeah. But the, they are maintained by NARA. Mm -hmm. I thought the Library of Congress also was preserving tweets. Know. They they had an agreement early on with right. with Twitter, but I'm not sure that's still alive. Okay. But you have you have them now, mm -hmm. at least for President Trump's. Interesting. Okay. And how does the U.S. Digital Service partner or work with NARA? Whoa. We had um, we had the benefit of two of the members of the U.S. Digital Service working with us on some what I would call machine learning applications, um, which, I, which was very positive. Um, and it was like um, some early stages of some other th uh, artificial intelligence entities that exist now. So facial recognition, for instance, on photographs, being able to process large amounts of archival material based on previous um, archival descriptions from like content. Um, and it, uh, they, it provided a model for um, a, a futuristic processing environment. Um, and then they were pulled away to do something else. It was, it was exciting to think about um, artificial intelligence applications, and, and since then, um, we have been working, our chief innovation officer has been working with uh, Virginia Tech on just that, I had two symposia, um, working with them on, um, and I believe there's a prototype in the works. Okay. So. Now that you are retired, how are you spending your time? Are you getting still involved and engaged in these areas, or are you fishing and uh, you know hiking and doing other things? Or? I'm not fishing and hiking, um, <clears throat> and I'm not involved in the, those things anymore. You know, I'm just reading what I can read, and um, and I don't have any communication with. Uh, you know, I'm not involved in the, with the National Archives anymore. So I'm just commenting on, my comments today are based on my own experience as of um, the end of April. Um, I love that place. I you know, feel strongly about the mission. Um, and I want my staff treated effectively. Um, and that's about it. <laughs> well, I want to be respectful of everyone's time as we come on the, the, the conclusion of our, our time together. What, what might we be surprised to learn about you? Is there something that... Yeah, let me, let's go back to the toilet. Because <laughs> it's not all, you know, it's not all serious. Um, so, when I learned about this <clears throat> and had a conversation with um, the the worm about the situation. Um, it was towards the end of my um, my time at the National Archives, and there are 18 members of, the, of that unit, and I invited them to come to the National Archives for a tour because most of them had never never been there. So, um, and in advance, I had asked a friend of mine who is a novelist who has published a wonderful book called. Rachel to the Rescue, uh -huh, which is in the Rachel, collection. Look at that. <clears throat> Talk about a reference librarian. Which is in the collection here. Rachel to the Rescue. Eleanor Lippman is the author, and she's an old friend. And um, she, Rachel is a young intern working in the White House Office of Records Management, taping together torn up records. <laughs> so I had. Ellie inscribed copies for each member of the White House Office of Records Management for, for, when, for their visit and presented them copies of the book. But the best part was, and then I presented Phil, the director, with a plunger with his name on it. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, this is great. The, uh, 
the intro here. I, I, this is, this was, so this was published in 2020. And uh, let me just read this real quick because it's funny. The president's unofficial filing system, that's in quotes, involves tearing up documents into pieces, even when they're supposed to be preserved. It was a painstaking process that was the result of a clash between legal requirements to preserve White House records and President Donald Trump's odd and enduring habit of ripping up papers when he's done with them. <laughs> this is great. So you can check this out. There's one version, right? one copy right now, right? You have your CLP card. And well, there are, I'm told there are six copies in the collection. Well, please join me in uh, thanking David Ferriero for being here with us today. That was a lot of fun, for sure. For me. So. Thank you. Thanks for coming. <laughs>